On December 9, 2013, U.S. Congresswoman Jackie Spear, California Assemblyman Rich Gordon, and San Mateo County Supervisor Dave Pine held an event on meeting the challenge of sea level rise in San Mateo County. This event was held at the College of San Mateo. Well, first and foremost, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I'm the Chancellor Ron Galatolo, and I would like to welcome you to this beautiful campus here at College of San Mateo. So good morning. Actually, I want to just uh, acknowledge a couple of individuals who are part of our district. Um, a member that is going to be uh, elected, or was elected, and will be sworn in this Wednesday to our Board of Trustees, uh, Tom Moore. Tom Moore is here. And I'll be inviting up, uh, just in a minute, um, the President of uh, College of San Mateo, Mike Clare, as well. He's over here. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming today. This is a very important topic, and while uh, we're not projecting any beachfront property here at this elevation at this campus, um, just a few feet of sea level change I think will have a dramatic effect on virtually every resident of the Greater Bay Area, uh, whether it be directly or indirectly. So I think this is a very important topic. And uh, the, the three co-hosts today here have shown immense leadership with regard to this issue. I know that the Congresswoman has been focused on this issue with a, 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 a laser beam uh, focus, and also the um, um, assembly member as well as um, the supervisors. So uh, I want to thank uh, the three of them for showing leadership on this very important issue for our community. What I'd like to do is invite the president of College of San Mateo to come up here and say a few words to welcome you to the college. And if you get a chance uh, later today, I highly recommend that you walk on our campus. We have uh, invested about a billion dollars on this college and the other two colleges that make up our district. And uh, they're quite beautiful institutions, really uh, prepared for 21st century teaching and learning. But I'd like to invite the president, Mike Clare. <laughs> Thank you and good morning and I too would just like to uh, first of all welcome you to our beautiful college and really echo the words of Chancellor Gallo Tolo and express our appreciation for the leadership of the Congresswoman uh, Assembly Member and Supervisor and as educators we also appreciate their leadership re with regard to education issues. So again welcome to the college and I look forward to today. Thank you. Thank you Mike. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, someone you all know that is really taking uh, incredible leadership on, on this issue, and it's a very important issue for all of us. Um, we are very blessed to have uh, one of the best members of Congress representing us here in this district. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Congresswoman Jackie Speer. Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled that you are here. This is a crowd of close to 300 people, and uh, it is critical that we all come together and recognize that we have work to do. And it's no coincidence that we have the federal, the state, and the county engaged in coming together as a team with uh, Dave Pine and Rich Gordon and myself to try and start to develop a thinking about what we're gonna do. There's no question that we're gonna see sea level rise. Uh, that's the reality. We've seen an increase of about um, one inch in um, the last 100 years. There is an expectation that there will be at least um, three feet of an increase in the next 100 years. Whether it's three feet or six feet or two feet, it's real. And uh, when we think about the hot spots around the country, we think about the Gulf Coast and uh, the Northeastern Corridor. But believe it or not, San Mateo County is among the top 10 hot spots in this nation. And we're gonna be battered by both the Bay 
and the Pacific Ocean. So we have to take this seriously and do something about it. What we did learn from the uh, Superstorm Sandy is that uh, it's expensive. When you don't do anything, it's very expensive, like $60 billion worth of expense. Now, had a barrier been constructed, as had been recommended, it would have been 10 to $15 billion. So um, we have a great luxury of living in a community that has the smartest people on the planet. <laughs> and that's going to serve us very well as we help to develop what our plan is uh, to address this issue. So uh, I join my colleagues in welcoming you and for participating in what will be an outstanding program for all of us. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Assemblyman Rich Gordon, and I want to uh, thank you. I want to uh, begin with uh, words of thank you, uh, particularly to uh, my two elected colleagues, uh, Congresswoman Speer, Supervisor Pine, for the work that they have done in helping to bring this event together. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, for the past year, I've had the honor of chairing a select committee in the California legislature. It is the Committee on Sea Level Rise and the California Economy. And as we have looked at the issues of, on this incredible coastal state uh, and the challenges that we will face in our economy uh, with sea level rise, it's clear that we must begin to think and plan, and that's what today is about. Today is an opportunity for us uh, to get uh, all on the same page with the same basic information, begin to think about what we must do, uh, and hopefully uh, begin to challenge ourselves uh, to take this seriously uh, and to prepare. And with that, um, let me introduce uh, uh, County Supervisor Dave Pine. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's terrific to have uh, such a great gathering to begin a dialogue about one of the most important issues that we face. It was with some irony, of course, that we're having this convening at one of the highest points in San Mateo County on one of the coldest days in San Mateo County. But things are going to warm up, and we're going to go downhill from here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to um, thank uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Supervisor Horsley, Supervisor Groom, Supervisor Tissier, and the county manager for their support of this conference and their support of, 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 my, of my efforts. Later uh, today, I'll, I'll speak about various things that I've been engaged in to start to think about this issue. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, really get to uh, our keynote, which uh, you're really in for a treat. So let me introduce John Englander. John Englander is an oceanographer, consultant, and author. He has witnessed firsthand the impacts of climate change through expeditions under the polar ice cap, deep dives in research submarines, and visits to Greenland and, and Antarctica. His marine science background, coupled with his degrees in geology and economics, allows him to be an insightful voice on our changing climate and oceans. Mr. Englander has held a variety of leadership positions in both the private and nonprofit sectors, serving as CEO for the Cousteau Society, the International Sea Keeper Society, and the Underwater Explorer Society. He is now president of, of the Sea Level Institute, working with businesses, governments, and communities to understand the financial and societal impacts of sea level rise. Now, John is also somewhat of an adventurer. He has completed uh, 5,000 scuba dives uh, and uh, is also a multi-engine pilot with 3,000 logged hours. So when the going gets tough, he can be under the water or over the water. And he has recently published um, the following book, High Tide on Main Street. Uh, it's been very well received. Uh, it discusses, of course, the rising sea level and what it means <clears throat> to our, <clears throat> our coastal uh, areas. He has been going around the country and the world, for that matter, you know, talking about this issue. And his mission is, is, uh, is to be clear in an objective voice about our changing climate and the oceans. Uh, John uh, really has a unique ability to translate very complex scientific information 
about the climate, the oceans, and global warming you know, into plain language and make it accessible to a broad audience. So I think you'll really look at the world a lot differently after seeing the presentation from John. Um, and with the warming planet and sea level rise, you know, looking th at things differently is the first step to taking action. So please join me in welcoming John Englander. Good morning. I, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I live in Florida, so the cold weather is, uh, is a little bit different. The, uh, I've spent actually the last week in the Bay Area and am becoming more and more aware of the different things going on here to make people aware of and prepare for sea level rise. And just to echo the words of all of the people who spoke before me, but I think we need to really appreciate the political leadership here, uh, both Supervisor Pine and Congresswoman Speer and Assemblyman Gordon at the different levels. But also, I think we really need to recognize all of you here today, because for 300 people to come out and be concerned about this issue indicates that you know something different is happening. This is an unusual issue. Some people think it's controversial. It's, it's a strange issue because it happens so slowly. We only see it during those uh, days of extreme tides when we get flooding. But most of you realize, and I, I, I assume by the very fact that you're here on a, on a brisk Monday morning, that this is something profound. And so at every level, I want to really honor, not just thank you, but congratulate you on your concern for not only what happens tomorrow or the next extreme tide, or the next storm, but for something that at some level you recognize is different than through all of human history. The title here, Planning Ahead, sounds redundant, but it's purposeful. We plan all the time. We plan for things next week. We plan for street changes and new housing divisions and so on. But usually when we plan, we're doing it incrementally. We're planning the way we've always done it. Sometimes you plan for events that you don't know exactly when they're going to happen, like an earthquake, which you're very familiar with out here. You still plan for them. What's different about sea level rise is sea level has not been higher than the present for 120,000 years. So it's the one thing that we need to plan for that's going to change everything that we have no prior experience with. And that's what makes it different. It's not in the human experience. 120,000 years ago, sea level got 25 feet higher than it is today. That's part of the natural ice age cycles. But again, that's outside the realm of human experience. So what I want to help you do today is put in context, sea level rise, and begin to envision a different world. And this is no longer a hypothesis. And while some people would like to make it controversial, and we can argue about or disagree about how high might it get by the end of the century, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the fact that the oceans are warmer they are measurably one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they were a century ago. It's the basic issue. And a warmer ocean, which is a big heat sump, giant outdoor swimming pool, that warmer ocean means the ice sheets are going to continue to get smaller. Let's see if this. Of course, when we start to think of sea level rise in this area, one of the first things that everybody imagines is San Francisco Airport. And for good reason, it's large and it's low and it's flat and an important part of this economy and community. And in the next segment, you're going to hear more about the local area from an expert, uh, Will Travis. Uh, but I want to remind you before we even get started and before I take you on a global view to show you some factors of sea level rise 
and again, put it in the historical context to give it certainty and clarity and talk about why we can't exactly say how much sea level rise we'll have this century. That, sorry here. It's not just limited to the very low areas that we think of right on the ocean. Sacramento, which of course is very important here, is some 80 miles away, and Sacramento's on a tidal river. Not only is it vulnerable to sea level rise, a federal analysis, actually combined with some state work a few years ago, determined that Sacramento is more vulnerable to the failure of earthen levees than New Orleans. Some of you probably know that. But it's not only the state capital that's at risk, it's some of the most valuable farmland in the world. So even though we tend to think of sea level on a very narrow level, we have to consider that this is something really profound. It's going to be the biggest change to this planet this century. How can I say that? Well, there'll be a lot of changes, of course, but this will be the one that you can see in the next satellite photo from outer space, the famous shots we all look at for Earth. The boundary between the ocean and the land is going to change to the point where you can see the difference. Nothing's more profound than that. It defines where we can live. While there's been confusion and some arguments about climate change, global warming, whatever you wish to call it, of course, on a morning like this, we might wish it was warmer, but um, it's becoming recognized, as you probably saw the, a couple of months ago, the cover of National Geographic, certainly an accepted and not a not an outlandish publication, but put it right on the cover, and they actually did something rather extreme. They created a map showing what happens when all the ice melts. Antarctica and Greenland, 212 feet of sea level rise. Now that's not, the, I'm not too sure that that does us a service, because it's kind of paralyzing. And it can happen this century, it can happen next century, it can happen the century after that. So I'm not too sure that that's good communication, frankly. What I want to talk to you about is to put things in a realistic concept of what should we plan for in the decades ahead and thinking ahead a century for our grandchildren. I'd like to cover, as simply as possible, the basic science and facts because there is a bit of confusion about even what causes sea level rise. Some of it you probably know. Some of you here probably have it exactly right. But I want to make sure we don't have misunderstandings about the causes of sea level rise and the magnitudes and what can happen. And at the end of my talk, I'd be glad to take questions, time permitting. So we want to talk about how high could it get and how soon. And then within the uncertainties, what are they? To make sure we understand them. And then I would like to share with you from my experience of the last year and a half since my book's been out on traveling around and, and trying to figure out how do we inform and inspire without having people shut down and kind of get paralyzed by this really strange new reality. That can be paralyzing. So I'd like to share some perspectives with you. The first thing to remind us ourselves is something that probably is buried in your intuitive awareness, but is worth pointing out. Sea level is the base level, and it hasn't changed in a few thousand years, so we just assumed it was a, a, a constant, but it's not. Sea level moves up and down hundreds of feet over geologic time, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But on top of sea level rise, we have the daily tides. And then a few days a month and at certain times of the year, the tides are extreme. Lunar, high, lunar tide, full moon, new moon tides, that's when the streets flood unusually and at certain times of the year. And then, of course, we know what a storm is. Not more affecting, of course, the Pacific Coast part of San Mateo County, but also the storm surge can have impacts even in the Bay Area, although muted. And it's as those three things pile up that the maximum height of the moment is attained, which determines how far inland the water reaches. But what's different that very few people stop to think about is that the tide cycle is six hours 
the storm surge recedes within a day or two. And the land is still there after those two events. What's different about sea level rise is sea level is a very slow phenomenon. And while it's slow to show itself, it's slow to disappear. It will take centuries, in fact, thousands of years for the ice sheets to expand enough to reduce sea level, to allow it to drop. We don't tend to think of that. So while the three things combine, the big difference is that sea level won't go away. So as it goes, it may be the tortoise, the inch by inch by inch, as opposed to the big storm surge or the tide rise, but sea level just keeps getting higher. And we'll talk about that. But it's the fundamental difference. So first, let's look at what's happened with sea level rise over the last um, century, effectively, a little more than that here. But if we take the middle part of this, this shows the average sea level change in the world over the last 100 years. And it's risen about eight inches. And actually, while it varies in different places, right here in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's about the global average, about eight inches. Now, when a lot of people look at, or even want to argue about sea level rise, they tend to talk about the little ups and downs. And I suggest it's a little bit like talking about stocks or gold prices or anything else. You can get ground up in all the details of the little blips, or you can look at the long-term picture. And the long-term picture of global sea level rise from hundreds of tide stations around the world, and now satellite data, is pretty clear. If you could buy that stock, you'd probably want to do it, wouldn't you? Right? It wouldn't matter what it did last week. But sea level rise, one of the reasons it's confusing is it doesn't affect every place the same. That same eight inches of rise shown as a red wavy line toward the bottom varies from Los Angeles on the right at four inches to New York in the middle at 14 inches to New Orleans on the left at 46 inches. Now that's counterintuitive. You'd think that water would find its level and be the same everywhere. But the difference is that land moves up and down slowly, tectonically, as you know here in California. And the reason that Los Angeles has less sea level rise apparent than here is because the land down there has ra risen another four inches more than the Bay Area over the last century. Imperceptible, but it has a big impact on the apparent sea level change in different areas. We need to go up to the Arctic to start to talk about what's causing sea level and to get rid of some misinformation. You've all seen images like this lone polar bear, which are perhaps charismatic, perhaps um, um, emotional, about what's going to happen as the ice disappears. And I'm not going to get into that today. I certainly um, would agree with a lot of that. But our problems are way beyond the polar bear. They happen where we live, here in the Bay Area and elsewhere. And the melting Arctic ice cap does not add to sea level rise, and that surprises a lot of people to learn. Some of you probably know that. But it's because those are floating chunks of ice, and like ice cubes in a glass, as they melt, they do not change the level of liquid in the glass, whether it be iced tea or the Arctic Ocean. It doesn't make any difference. It's already floating. So its weight is displaced, and it doesn't change the level of the liquid. That's a big surprise to people. Sea level rise comes from a few sources. Um, again, once an iceberg is in the ocean, it's no longer affecting sea level rise. But when you get to where s those icebergs come from, and in the Arctic, a lot of them come from Greenland, so we're going to go there in a second. But simply stated, sea level, comes, sea level rise comes from just a few things. As seawater warms up, it expands. Most substances, you know, um, parts don't fit. Maybe, maybe something this morning in the 25 degree weather didn't fit right the way it normally does on your car or the, in your house key or something like that. And it's because parts expand slightly. And the seawater expands slightly. And the ocean is about three or four inches higher than it was a century ago, purely because it's warmer. And that will continue. And then the glaciers are melting. And as glaciers melt and run into the ocean, they affect sea level. But all of the glaciers in the world, and that's nearly 200,000 glaciers, 
when they all melt, will raise the ocean about two or three feet. Significant, but not the big deal. The big deal starts in Greenland as glaciers calve off into icebergs. And I want to take in a quick tour there from a trip I did in 2007, just to help you visualize that where the icebergs come from is the face of the glacier. And as you travel up the glacier by helicopter, you get to see visibly what a glacier is. It's that bending river of ice. And when you get up to the top of the ice sheet, and there's only two big ice sheets in the world, major ice sheets. One is at the top of Greenland and one is in Antarctica. As you get to the top of the two mile thick ice sheet that's in Greenland, which is similar to the ice sheet that used to cover North America during the Ice Age, we begin to see the problem. On the far left, that sheen is the meltwater. And there's no mountains here. This isn't water coming from somewhere else, like, like in California coming from the Sierra Nevada. This water is just happening because of the melting. And it gathers in these rivulets and streams, bigger and bigger streams. And for scale, those are the two helicopters in the background. And you've probably seen photos in National Geographic and elsewhere again. These are torrents of water. They find a crack. They work their way straight down to the bottom of the ice sheet. Two things happen. That water does add to sea level when it reaches the ocean. And also, as it lifts the ice off the bedrock, the glaciers are speeding up two and three times their speed, meaning they're calving off icebergs that much faster, which does add to sea level rise. When I was there in 2007, the helicopter pilots and scientists estimated there were about 100 of these moulons, or vertical shafts. Friends who were back there in 2012, which was a record warm year, but there were 1,000 of them. So without any arguments about the accuracy of the instruments or anything else, you can just count these number of these vertical streams carrying the meltwater. And a tenfold increase in five years is astounding. To give you the other piece of the puzzle, because Greenland, when it melts entirely, and again, it can happen this century, won't happen next century, would add 24 feet to global sea level, 10 times what glaciers would. But the big kahuna is Antarctica. Antarctica has got seven times more frozen water, snow and ice, than Greenland. So when it melts entirely, and again, here's where I think National Geographic may have done a slight disservice, is because it can happen for centuries, probably thousands of years, to melt entirely and flood the southeast United States, et cetera. Um, sea level will rise 185 feet. But we need to find the right path between enlightenment and facts and just being scared to the point where we can't do anything. And I, that's really important, that we talk with facts. What I do that's different is put sea level in the context of the ice ages, which gives it a certainty and a clarity. And I, so I want to take you back to the Ice Age. And I know some of you don't like science, probably. And uh, you're probably starting to get squeamish that maybe this is going to get too technical. But bear with me. I want to refresh your memories about the four-part documentary series. If you have uh, kids or grandkids, you've probably seen this probably not as many times as I had to watch it. I have a 12-year-old daughter. And um, when Ice Age Part Two: The Meltdown came out, I think I had to watch it about 20 or 30 times. So I've really got it memorized now. And behind Diego and Manny and Sid and the other creatures here, there's two miles of ice. And I show it there not only to lighten up the mood, because this does get pretty heavy for a moment, but on top of that, it's a simple visual that that two miles of ice, roughly 10,000 feet, as it melts, it's what caused the ocean to rise 390 feet. But again, what this simple graph shows is that it doesn't rise smoothly. And it's been at this height for about six or 8,000 years. And there's a lot of knowledge in this simple image. As the ice sheets melted from 20,000 years ago during the peak of the last ice age, it seems like a long time ago. But when you think about you know, even ancient biblical times, and 5,000 years is not too far to, to imagine back 
in our historical record, well, four times that, that age ago, not that far ago, not that long ago, I should say. Sea level was down 390 feet, but here's the amazing thing. For human civilization goes back around 6,000 years, depending upon your metric, but it does, certainly doesn't go back 10,000 years. Our written records go back about six or 8,000 years. We have some archeologic shards that go back 40,000 years, perhaps, but, but human civilization as we know it is less than 10,000 years old. Six or 8,000 would be the normal estimate that most archeologists and, and uh, historians would give. For that whole period of time, sea level's been pretty much where it is today. So that's the reason we tend to disbelieve it's gonna change. Because again, for all of our human history, it's been there. Now, to put it in simple visual terms, if we were at the 30th floor of a building, just 20,000 years ago, sea level was at the ground floor. And when, and I again want to stress when, not this century, not next century, not the century thereafter, but when all the remaining ice on the planet melts, sea level will rise another 17 floors. Now, if that paralyzes you, I just catch yourself, okay? If we have 500 years or 5,000 years to deal with this, we can manage. Let's be realistic. Our challenge is what do we do in our lifetimes for planning for our children and grandchildren so that our investments in our community and our businesses are positive and have a return on investment that, they, that they're designed for the environment that they will find. We do not need to worry about what's gonna happen 300 years from now or 3,000 years from now. It's like anything else. I mean, it's like hearing you've got a terrible medical condition. You kind of have to take one step at a time. Let's try and swallow the, the giant animal in chunks. This is the last technical graph I'm gonna show you. This isn't gonna be a science lecture. One of the things that I do in terms of explaining the science of sea level, is not only to put it in historical perspective, but I like it to be such that any high school student can understand it. The truth is that any intelligent person who understands the English language can understand this. You don't need a scientific background. But this one slide I'm gonna spend about a minute on, and if any of you wanna send me an email, I'll even let you have this slide to use for your outside educational efforts, and I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. But this single graph is an entire course in climate and sea level. It's 420,000 years from left to right, and it's three different reference points. The top is a greenhouse gas in green, CO2. The middle is the global average temperature in red, red for heat, make it easy to remember, and bottom is in blue, is sea level. Now you see the three lines go up and down, and the first thing you notice is they go up and down together. Do you see that? And kind of line up. The peaks are all in sync. There are slight differences. Nobody would expect they'd be exactly the same, but that's not a coincidence. And the two or three points I'd like to just make to you are this, that they each have a normal boundary. Sea level moves up and down about 350 feet with each ice age. The ice age pattern about every 100,000 years, based upon a solar variation called the Milankovitch cycle, says the global average temperature varies about nine degrees Fahrenheit. And CO2, carbon dioxide, has a range of 180 to 280. And again, I, I round things off to make them easy to remember. The problem is in the far upper right of the screen. Can you see that little straight line in the red circle in the far upper right? Everybody see that? Okay. I've either stunned you or you're frozen still from the outside. Uh, that the problem is that carbon dioxide is now approaching 400 parts per million, 40% higher than the normal range of the last 10 million years. And CO2 and carbon do go in unison. Interestingly, one can cause the other to change, but they just, they move together and I can tell you why or if you get my book, you'll find it out, but it's, it's, really, it's on my website too, but it's a, it's a very simple physics phenomenon. CO2 traps heat, that's a 
principle of physics figured out about 180 years ago. And as the oceans warm, they release CO2. So it, they go together, and there's a cause and effect. The problem now is we're raising CO2 fast enough that we don't know how quickly temperature will rise, nor do we know how quickly you can melt the ice sheets. The takeaways from this are a couple. If you look at sea level in the lower right, we are at the high spot of the historic sea level cycles, just as we're at the high spot of the traditional cycles of CO2 and temperature. Now things should be headed cooler, growing ice, and dropping sea level based upon the ice age cycles of the last five million years. Those three things are going in the wrong direction, or unnatural direction. You with me? Make sense so far that we've got a natural cycle. There are natural climate cycles. The best indication of that is the ice ages, which as the planet gets colder and evaporation happens and rainfall and snow that the ice sheets build up over tens of thousands of years. And as the ice sheets grow, the oceans drop. And it is a natural cycle. But it's changed now. CO2 is going up, temperature's rising a degree and a half, the ocean's rising eight inches, and they're all heading faster and faster. That's the climate course, OK? Um, the other thing is that, well, the other proof of that is that that 100,000-year cycle, again, this 420,000 years left to right, that 100,000-year cycle between the peaks breaks down to one other interesting thing is that the sea level well, actually, all three of the metrics descend for about 80,000 years and then rise for about 20,000. It's one of those many things in life that's an 80-20 rule. And I didn't understand that until I put the case together in my book, to tell you the truth. I really assumed it was 50-50, and it's not. But it's really important because that's why, again, we're at the high point. Sea level has risen for 20,000 years, and it should be about at the turning point. Now, if somebody said to me on challenged me on TV. So he says, you're saying that it, you know, sea level this year should be going down. I said, no, I didn't say that. Geologic time doesn't work like that. It's a 100,000 year cycle. But somewhere this century, we should have been at the turning point where we're heading 80,000 years toward the next ice age. Well, we've solved that problem. You can put away the winter clothes. We're not going to have an ice age in 80,000 years. Um, how do we know that? Ice core data, I'm not going to get too deeply into it, but the first question people always say is, well, how could you possibly know what ancient temperatures and carbon dioxide levels were without instruments? Well, fortunately, nature's preserved a really good uh, uh, sample set going back 800,000 years in the ice cores of Greenland and Antarctica, and those little bubbles in the photo at the lower right are air samples that were trapped, and we can date them to within three years of with the year that the air sample was trapped. We can measure the carbon dioxide, and there are two different isotopes of oxygen which tell us the temperature at the time. Pretty amazing stuff. So what are scientists saying about sea level? Um, you, how many of you have heard of the IPCC? The inter wow, that's amazing. I don't think I've ever seen that. That's pretty. Um, I think everybody raised their hand. That's wild. Um, anyway, uh, the, well, you know what it is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Every five or six years they give a report. The latest one, the fifth report, came out September 27th. And uh, it's got a lot of attention because their projections for sea level rise almost doubled from the last one. They now say that if you read, if you look at the little table in the report, it says that sea level rise this century could be 10 to 32 inches higher based upon four different scenarios. It's impressive that that almost doubled the seven to, seven to 17 inches in the last report. But it's wrong. How can John Englander say that the IPCC is wrong, 2,000 scientists? They're not wrong, but it's misleading. It would lead you to think that the worst that could happen is 32 inches of sea level rise, right, by the end of the century. That's not what it says. It's like most documents. You kind of have to read the fine print or never really know what's between the lines. If you read the fine print of this report that's, I don't know, three or four inches thick, it says there's a few things that we're counting in this, like thermal expansion of seawater and melting of glaciers and what's happening in Greenland now. 
And we can say for sure that that's going to happen, that we're, we're stake our reputations on it, our scientific integrity, and tell people they must plan for that, 10 to 32 inches. There's a few things we're not too sure about and can't quantify by the end of the century. Um, and I'll talk about them in a minute. But first, I want to show you how well they've done to date in projecting the future. Because, you know, it's like anything. If you want to say, how good are you at predicting things, let's say, how have you done? Well, the IPCC started the first projections for sea level rise in 1990, shown here in blue. Different ranges of confidence, different possibilities. And I'm just showing you the next 20 years to get us to the present, basically. And then in 2000, they did another set of projections shown in green. Are you all able to see that in the back? OK. And as one might expect, the projections raised a little bit and narrowed. Because time had progressed, we got better data, right? Makes sense? Well, now we get to go back and say, how well did they do? In gold is actual sea level. And because of little variations and inconsistencies, we tend to like to smooth it out with a trend line in red. And this should not have happened, that in 20 years, two different sets of projections by 2,000 scientists telling us what could happen, that the actual is at or above the highest projection. The projections are consistently low. And it's not because of bad science. It's because we haven't really understood what the IPCC says. The IPCC says, what do we know will happen that we can quantify by a certain year? So if something's kind of hard to assess, they don't quantify it and they leave it out and they say that in the notes. West, uh, West Antarctica, particularly the place here shown in red, is melting faster and faster, getting warmer at this, actually at this point, but the, ice, the glaciers are, are loosening. We don't know when they will slide into the ocean. But when two glaciers there slide into the ocean, over about 10 or 15 years, we're going to get 10 feet of sea level rise, catastrophic sea level rise. We can hope that it's 300 years from now. But the evidence indicates to me that there's a reasonable chance it's going to happen this century. But I can't tell you that for sure nor can the IPCC, so they don't put it in the figures because it's a risk, it's not a certainty. The other thing that's happening quickly is that methane is coming out of the ground. And the fact that you know about the IPCC, you probably know something about methane. Methane is really a problem. It's probably the big tipping point for climate because there's a huge amount of it stored in the permafrost and the seabed, uh, something called methane clathrates, and uh, just a tremendous quantity of it, and it's coming out of the ground, bubbling out of the ocean, and coming out of a lake in Siberia here where they flare it. And somebody actually ran a line to their home and used it for heating the, the house, which is nice. They got free methane. But the problem is, because of the way it's coming out of the ground, not only can't we capture it realistically on a global scale, but we really can't predict how it's going to come out, how quickly, how much of it. So because you can't quantify it, it's left out of the IPCC figures. And methane's much more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, the warming gas. In fact, it's often misquoted or misunderstood. But in the first 20 years from being released in the atmosphere, while it does degrade and become less potent, the average for 20 years is that it's 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And methane is effectively natural gas. So as we do more fracking operations and more use of natural gas, which is a much better energy source than coal and other sources like that in terms of global warming potential, we have to be concerned that the amount of methane doesn't accelerate the warming. But again, the IPCC leaves that out of its sea level tables because they can't quantify it. So here's what I want to bring you to in terms of how do we think about this. I've kind of given you the science basis now. we need to think differently about the shoreline. There's an illusion when we look at the shore. One is that it's always been there and always will be, as if it's permanent. Well, the beach has been there for, again, maybe five or 10,000 years, but that's not permanent. 
And if it had kept changing at the rate that it used to change, it wouldn't be a problem. But things are happening a lot more quickly now. We're warming hundreds of times faster than at any known time in the last 500 million years. This is uncharted territory. And there's no point at this point in uh, just becoming uh, angry or finding blame. Um, it's like anything else that's just reality. While we may want to slow it, we really need to begin to deal with the symptoms. And what does it mean for how we live? So first I would try and wrap up the science with a couple of points just to make sure we leave here with the same summary. And if somebody wants to challenge us, I'd certainly welcome that during the Q&A. I can tell you that I've given this talk dozens and dozens of times to some pretty hostile audiences uh, in some cases. And uh, no one has yet refuted some basic points here that the warmer temperature of the ocean means that the ice is going to get smaller, the ice sheets. And as the ice sheets get smaller, sea level will rise. And as sea level rises, that the shoreline will move inland. That's basic four points are pretty hard to argue with. And that's basically my thesis. And it hasn't changed for thousands of years. It is going to get higher. And I like to suggest, having really thought about how do we deal with this, that we begin to think about three feet. I think that we're, we're almost asking the wrong question, saying how high will sea level rise by a date? The reason is that we can't possibly know how much ice will melt this century because we don't know how warm it'll get. We can't possibly know how warm it'll get because we don't even know how we're gonna produce the energy. In other words, if you think about whether we use nuclear or solar or coal or tar sands and how much energy we produce, and how many people we have in the next 87 years is going to determine how warm the planet is in the latter part of the century. And that's going to determine how much ice melts. So when people say, well, the scientists don't know whether it's going to be two feet or six feet, how good can it be? Well, we'll tell you how high sea level rise if you'll tell us for certain how much energy gets trapped in the atmosphere and how warm we are in the next 87 years. But we do have one other problem is we've never warmed this fast. So the models are just models for what will happen. Because we can't test that model. We're running the experiment now to see how quickly we can melt the ice sheets. It's a bit of a dangerous experiment, but it is what it is. Um, and as a result, the official estimates tend to be low because they want to say what they know for sure. And we should recognize that we can slow the rise of sea level, and we should, through sustainable actions and carbon footprints and all those things. But we also need to begin adapting to a new reality, to a rising sea level. And as a way to kind of visualize this, as I, uh, and I will wrap up in a few minutes and give you time for questions, um, this is a house in South Florida near where I live. And it's not too far from the intercoastal waterway. And that storm drain there in the front of the, the driveway was put in there to allow when rainfall happened in, in large amounts, as happens in Florida sometimes, that it would drain itself to the intercoastal waterway. Well, a couple of days a month, this gentleman has a saltwater swimming pool in his front yard, regardless of rainfall. Because when the tides are extreme during full moon or new moon high tides, the water backs up from the intercoastal waterway, and that's salt water. But it's not just Florida. You have this happen here in San Mateo. Probably a lot of you know that. Seattle, king tides, streets are flooded. Australia, besides the funny dog on the surfboard, it's there to remind us this is a global problem. And those are car wheels sitting in salt water. In Miami, that's happening regularly. The car wheels are rusting, driving through the streets in the center of Miami Beach. This is a global problem. From Boston, with $400 billion at risk of property for a foot and a half of sea level rise, to Hong Kong, $140 billion at risk. This is a global problem. Auckland kind of looks like Oakland. It all looks the same after a while. Because we've built up to the shoreline thinking it was permanent, and it's not. 
So what can we do about it? Well, here's an example from the Netherlands. The Dutch are some of the leaders in the world because they've been dealing with land that's below sea level and a variety of reasons that they've had to cope with uh, reclaiming land from the sea and per defending themselves against North Sea storms for a long time. And here's an example of what can be done. This is not a rendering, this is an actual village, the blessing in down on the, the coast near Belgium. And just to give you some example of some clever ideas, I mean, not only is there a levee there of several meters, and you can tell by the staircases going up on the right side, and then the road is higher than that by another meter or so, and the newer buildings, the one with the red um, scaffolding-like architecture on the front, the tallest building there, even that's another meter or two above the street level. And then in this entire town, because of good advanced planning, the ground floor is a wash through, that it's designed that in the worst case of a North Sea storm, that there's no critical machinery that would get affected by salt water. So they have gotten their critical equipment and most of their town high. Now this would not, there was a group from the Miami Chamber of Commerce that took me over there in September to see what the answers the Dutch would have. And as I, I, I knew what happened, they'd realize that there's a lot of great examples, but there's limitations. We have porous limestone in Florida. A seawall like this would not keep the water out. It would just percolate up through the ground. So we have a different problem. You don't have that here, fortunately. I won't get distracted by that. But let me use this final slide from the Netherlands. These are the famous gates at Rotterdam Harbor, which were finished in about 20 years ago. Six billion dollars to show you why we need to look ahead and plan ahead. The Dutch are as advanced as anybody in their engineering and their, and their solutions. When they designed these gates to protect Rotterdam Harbor, the busiest port in Europe and still the second busiest port in the world, they designed it for North Sea storms and floods coming down the rivers from Europe. And they also allowed for 30 centimeters or a foot of sea level rise. Because when they designed this in the 1970s, that was all they could imagine. Nobody thought you could melt the ice sheets as quickly as is happening now. So they now know that this $6 billion solution to one, one site is going to be a, beyond its design criteria, which was intended to be, handle a one in 4,000 year storm. That'll happen this century. The Dutch have now reconvened the Delta Works II, and um, they, they're planning to spend a billion dollars a year to adapt to what they now see coming from sea level rise. So uh, bring us to obviously now the present time, but the present location. This is Redwood City, I believe. And uh, here we are. And, and the following speaker, after a few minutes of questions, is going to talk to you much more about the Bay Area. But I wanted to give you the overview to put in perspective what is going to happen. This isn't an opinion. The heat is already in the ocean. The ice will, will get smaller. Sea level will rise. Um, and, and on that, my, my final slide, I guess, we need to think about future generations. And the perspective I would share with you in closing is this, that while this is a daunting and can be depressing subject for people, here's a positive way to look at it. Most crises, whether they be tsunamis or tornadoes or earthquakes, leave, give you little warning of any. This one we can see coming decades in advance. We don't have any time to waste, but um, we have time to plan and to adapt. And that's unusual by something this big. The second is humans do the most amazing things when we focus on a problem, whether putting man on the moon or battling cancer or AIDS or anything else or terrorism. We do amazing things when we focus on the problem. So let's challenge ourselves. And also, while there'll be a lot of losses and we will lose some real estate, there'll be opportunity. That the right engineering, the right new ideas, even somebody who's gonna build a, a condominium, if they wanna build it three feet higher, it becomes a sales benefit or a sales feature, okay? So if we can see the future, there will be as much opportunity as there will be loss. And the sooner we see it and more clearly and stop arguing about whether it's happening, the more we will be better able to adapt and do so with a healthy economy and location. And the fourth point 
I think I said four on the slide, besides the normal three I give is that you in the Bay Area here have some special opportunities. I do travel all over the place explaining this science, my book and so on. But the truth is I've been here twice this year and I think the Bay Area because of institutions like BCDC and uh, Spur and the, and the county attitudes here and the regional approach and in your state and, and the, uh, some of the federal efforts, the Army Corps of Engineers and so on, looking at this problem at a regional level is to your credit and it gives you an opportunity to positively say what can we do for the future? We can tackle anything. So I applaud you for being here. I thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to take a few questions. Thank you very much. Okay, any, uh, the mics, are, there's two mics here, and they're going to bring them to the questions, and... Oh, the mics are... I'm sure they'll be fine. The technical people here... Okay. Yep, yeah, you're on. Okay. Yes, thank you for that uh, excellent and informative presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we think that now most of our uh, CO2 emissions arise causes for them hydrocarbons, but in the past, what do we think or what do we know caused those previous spikes in CO2 levels? Oh, um, what, what causes spikes in CO2 before human activities of, uh, you know, fossil fuels, et cetera? Fair question, uh, change in vegetation, uh, die-offs, um, volcanism, huge volcanoes way beyond anything in the last few hundred years. Uh, methane release, there have been some big methane releases historically, so there's, there's a lot of factors. It depends on how many hundred million years you want to go back and, and look at, but there, there certainly have been natural factors in it. Next. Hi. Uh, given that we can reach everybody on the planet within a few years with communication, I think Savory is the one who's doing the savanna carbon process, and there's also the arbor culture. Uh, if you, do you happen to know in terms of parts per million of carbon dioxide reduction, uh, if the whole, if everybody on this planet was really putting carbon back in soil, uh, using savory's techniques for grasslands, using permaculture, arboriculture techniques for forests, and uh, using permaculture for, for yep. farmland, how much do you think we could pull it down if we did a united, all hands on deck great, effort? Great question, uh, and, I, and I probably should have referred to that because it's an important point. Even if we did everything possible to reduce CO2 emissions, in fact, let me put it this way, even if not only using everything you described, but we found a magic way to not put any more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, kept it at 400 parts per million, okay? Sea level's still gonna rise because the heat's in the ocean. And that's what few people stop to think about. So that's why I say we need to begin adapting to slowly rising sea level while we also do what they call mitigate, which I, I think is too complicated a word, I call it slowing, um, while we try and slow the warming. But even if we were absolutely successful as we go from 7 billion to 10 billion people, remember too, is the other thing we have to remember, with all of our efficiency about carbon dioxide or sequestering it and taking it out, there's enough heat in the ocean that sea level will not stop rising. Next. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Dave Masson with Citizens Climate Lobby. We are lobbying Congress for a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we should be able to achieve the goals that scientists recommend, for example, uh, lowering emissions to 10% of 1990 levels by 2050. Mm -hmm. How much could that slow or stop uh, sea level rise? You know, and by the way, I applaud their, their efforts. I met with uh, your founder, Marshall Saunders, not too long ago in San Diego. Uh, it's a good effort uh, to get Congress to understand it. And of course, that's with great respect to the Congresswoman here, who obviously fully understands the problem. But a lot of people in Congress don't. Um, I don't know exactly the quantity, but again, I'll stand by the, sim the simple fact that while we may have a goal of getting to 350 parts per million, as some people would say, and we're keeping it at 400 or reducing it by 10%, all of those things 
we not only can I tell you how much will limit the rise in sea level, the truth is we don't know because what's happening in the Arctic right now, the collapse, if you saw the movie Chasing Ice or any of the other, which is, by the way, I'd hardly recommend, um, what's happening in the Arctic is, is so beyond our equations. Again, all of our climate models actually have not been able to predict how quickly the polar ice cap will disappear. Even though it doesn't affect sea level rise, it is the proof of warming. The polar ice cap has been there for three million years. Most of us in this room will be alive when the polar ice cap is gone. If anybody is confused about the enormity of what is happening, that's a fact to think about. That's not an instrument, it's the freezing point of water. The polar ice melts at 32 degrees, no matter what your political beliefs, right? Okay. And that melting ice is happening. And the photographs from space prove that that polar ice cap is disappearing and will be gone for a few days in September, sometime in the next two decades. It's been there for three million years. Now, it will start to grow, but we'll have thin ice, one of the 10 feet of ice that we've had for the last couple of million years. So, back to my, certainly we should try and do all of those things to reduce the emissions to slow the warming and all the other things. But while we're doing that, we should begin adapting to sea level rise. That's my point. There's a, we need two different paths. We need to adapt while we're slowing or mitigating. And a lot of times we, we sort of think that, well, if we do enough, a good enough job on the one, we won't have to deal with the other. Can you speak to the impact of sea level rise on ocean circulation shutdown? Um, I th it's more complicated than we can do right here. Uh, the, uh, the question is, can I speak to the impact of sea level rise on ocean circulation, like the, the, the big Atlantic current, which you think of as the Gulf Stream, but as the big overturning current, the conveyor belt. Um, it certainly affects it as the ice melts and the fresh water versus the salt water has an effect to slow the forces that drives the current. But I think it's beyond our topic today. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, one final question. Um, given your experience and given uh, all the variables, particularly methane with the uh, melting permafrost, if you were organizing this, how many feet would you plan for in terms of ocean rise? Great. I, thank you for uh, the opportunity to reinforce that. I, I think it's time to think three feet. I guess I got uh, off track there. We talk about it could be two feet, it could be four feet, it could be six feet. Jim Hansen, a very noted scientist, says on the current path it could be 15 feet. Um, but it would happen more toward the end of the century, pretty suddenly. This is what I netted out to, is that we're going to get three feet of sea level rise. It's just a matter of when. And instead of getting concerned about figuring out what year it will happen, I touched on that briefly. We can't know that because we don't know how warm it'll be 60, 80 years from now. As a result, Let's turn this, the question around. Instead of saying how many inches by a certain year, let's say we know we're going to get three feet of sea level rise. The best case, the, the longest time frame would be 100 years from now. The worst case would be 30 years from now. So let's start thinking about three feet of sea level rise because that, that's cooked in the equation. That heat's in the pipeline. It's in the ocean actually already. In fact, we're going to get more than three feet. But if we think about three feet, it becomes a great goal and a planning tool because it challenges us architecturally and engineering-wise and planning-wise, what are we going to do with three feet of sea level rise when it shows up? And the truth is it can get inspire us to do positive things. And if we think about three feet saying, we're not sure exactly when it will happen, we'll build for the future, we'll get a better return on investment, and we'll start ourselves thinking about what are we going to do when it goes beyond three feet? instead of hoping it's only one foot, which is what most people tend to talk about today. So I would like, I th thank you for that question, because I'd like to leave you with the thought that it's time to think three feet. As you here in San Mateo and in the Bay Area, think about how do we approach this problem that is slow and inexorable. It's not stoppable, but it's hard to see year to year. And then the next speaker um, is going to give you much more insight into what's going to happen at a local level in the Bay, uh, Will Travis. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great talk.